morning. It's good to see each one of you. We're gathered for the worship of our God. A couple of announcements before we begin this morning. First of all, thank you all for your prayers and support over the past couple of weeks as we've gone through that experience of the loss of my mother. I greatly appreciate your prayers and the beautiful flowers that the church sent to us as well. A reminder that today is the last day <clears throat> if you want to participate in that gift for the Far East. If you've got any further questions about that, please feel free to ask me. And then next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to be gathering for one service at 10.30 on Sunday morning. I'm looking forward to that more than you know. We aren't able to all gather in here, but the new regulations show that we can use various rooms. And so we're probably going to need to have about 10 people out in the fellowship hall. And we'll have the speaker going there, and I think we can probably have the doors open. And afterwards, if the weather is good, we can go outside and all fellowship together. So um, you'll, you'll get an email about that this coming week. Well, let's take our Bibles now and turn to the book of Psalms, number 89. The book of Psalms, number 89. And here we have a psalm which rejoices in the great mercies of God. We're going to read verses 1 to 8. Psalm 89 and beginning at verse 1. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the Holy Ones, and awesome above all who are around Him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as You are, O Lord, with Your faithfulness all around You. And so here's this psalm praising God's mercy, His committed love to His people. And even in these opening verses, we see that that steadfast love is focused in a particular way upon this covenant that God made with David. And of course, that covenant ultimately concerns our Lord Jesus Christ, the descendant of David, who is even now sitting on His holy throne. And it's through the Lord Jesus that the mercies of God come to us. Well, let's bow together and thank our God and seek to worship Him. Our Father, we would come and take up the words of this psalm. Who is mighty as You are, O Lord, with Your faithfulness all around You? Who is a God of steadfast love, committed to Your people like You are? We come before You rejoicing that this love that You show towards Your people is brought to us very close through the Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank You for His ministry, for His willingness to come and live a perfect life before You to give us the gift of righteousness and then to die on the cross that we might be forgiven. O oh, our Father, help us as we come and worship You today. May You be glorified in the midst of Your people. Grant to us the strength that we need through the ministry of Your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take our blue hymn books 
and turn to number 101, and we'll sing the words of this psalm that we were just reading together. Hymn number 101, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. our copies of God's Word again and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 19. In chapters 17 and 18 of Revelation we were learning about the great prostitute Babylon representing the great cities and commerce of our world, performing commerce and industry, trade, not to the glory of God as was initially intended in creation, but to fulfill man's lusts and, and greed. And so ultimately, all that being judged and destroyed. And the last note of chapter 18 is that as Babylon is destroyed, in her is found the blood of prophets and of saints and all who have been slain on the earth. So these great cities have been places where God's people have been killed. Now as we head into chapter 19, we come to the ultimate and final acts of history and we begin to read here about the second coming of Christ and the final judgment. So, with that note of what was found in Babylon, we begin reading in chapter 19 and verse 1. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! 
Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For His judgments are true and just. For He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, you who fear Him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which He is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arraigned in fine linen, white and pure, were following Him on white horses. From His mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who is sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the, the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh." Well, a pretty awesome chapter here, almost at the end of God's Word. Scenes of judgment at the end of history. It's remarkable that at the beginning of this chapter, what we learn about is the joy of God's people in God's judgments. As we see in just reading through this chapter, the judgments that are going to come to this earth are going to be terrible. And here we have a scene pictured using ancient imagery of a king on his horse coming with his armies against his enemies and the slaughter that takes place. And God's people are not standing back, gasping, closing their eyes. How can we stand to look at this? They're rejoicing. They're acknowledging that God's judgments are right and just and well-deserved. 
And we will be praising God as a result. One of the tremendous things that we will experience when the Lord Jesus returns is what is called here the marriage supper of the Lamb. And of course, again, using ancient marriage custom where initially a man and a woman would be betrothed and so in all sense married but not yet living together. And during that time, the man would be paying the dowry to the father, waiting finally to the wedding day. And then there would be the procession to the house of the bride where they would have a wonderful banquet. And then the procession back to the home of the groom. Well, we know that this is speaking of Christ and His relationship with His people, the church. And the betrothal has already taken place. Christ has bought us with His blood. And we're simply waiting for that great day of procession when the Lord Jesus will come for His bride and then there will be the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now brethren, I think we've all been to wedding feasts and banquets and receptions. And they're always wonderful times, times of joy, of of rich food and, and lots of fun. We've never been to a marriage supper like this before. And I think it's probably right for us to understand that this marriage supper will back in ancient days, it would go on for seven days I think this will be an eternal celebration. And then this awesome picture of our conquering Savior, followed by the armies of heaven and the resulting judgment. The note that is so important for us to take away is what we read at the end of verse 10. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. As John tries to grasp all of these images and symbols that help us understand what's going on now and into the future and at the end of time, the angel reminds John the most important thing is that you keep your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus. He's who it's all about. As we consider history and what's going on, he's in charge, he's working at God's plan, he's got that scroll in his hand that he's gradually unrolling and bringing God's plan into effect, and he's going to bring it all to conclusion. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This morning in prayer, we continue for uh, remembering the Far East. In the email I received late last night, which was early Sunday morning there, she said the warfare was so intense all around them. They were spending all night in the bomb shelters and just staying there. She said they could see the smoke, they could hear the the guns going off, they could feel the ground shaking from the bombs. She said the fact that their compound continues is a great testimony to the mercy of God in the midst of all of that. We need to continue to pray for them. They're expecting that the war is going to increase. The government army, which you remember, took over the country in a coup sometime last year, is getting incensed that the people are rising up against them. And so the killing and the torture is unbelievable. But God has kept them safe. The wall is almost built. The gates are shut and locked. They know that that is not ultimately their defense, but it is the Lord blessing those means. So let's keep praying for them. From Cyprus uh, this morning, I got the note that Sandra, that we've been praying for, has finally reached her home in Nigeria. Uh, He said um, 20,000 pounds, of course they're using British money there, was raised just in the last week and it covered every expense. It got her all the way home. And now she's with her family and she's in the hospital there 
and the work of ongoing recovery and healing. So let's thank God for that and continue to pray for her. Let's bow together before our Lord. Heavenly Father, these are awesome pictures You've given to us in the book of Revelation. Help us to ponder them. Help us, Lord, to be preparing that we might be involved on the side of the Lord Jesus in that great day. We know it's all of Your grace. And yet, Father, if the armies of heaven are clothed in these white righteous robes, the righteous deeds of the saints, we know that we must take with us to heaven those good works that You have prepared for us to do while we live here in this world. Help us, our God, to be looking to Christ, being washed in His blood daily, and seeking the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we might do those things that please You. Our Father, we keep pleading with You for this mission work in the Far East. Thank You for the ways that You have blessed it and kept them safe in the midst of incredible warfare. We thank You, our God, for Your mercy to them. We know that the leadership is so exhausted not sleeping in the day or at night as the warfare continues. Please provide for them all that they need. Father, we also give You thanks for answering prayer for Sandra, this girl who is studying in Cyprus and has now returned home to Nigeria. Thank You for all of the money that was given to pay the hospital bills and to provide her passage home. Lord, we pray now that she's in the hospital surrounded with her family, that You would do for her all that she needs, that You would be pleased to raise her up, and our God, may she be a living testimony before the people of her, of her town of the good things that You have done for her. Our Father, we also look to You for more opening up next Sunday. We pray that in Your mercy You would bring it about. That we would have this tremendous privilege of being able to all gather together and worship You. Heavenly Father, continue to watch over Your church. Please keep us safe physically and spiritually that we might be servants of the Lord Jesus spreading the Gospel in these days. We ask in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, please take your red hymn books now and turn with me to number 157 as we're reminded of the great love of our Savior, of our Father, in sending our Savior to die in our place. Hymn 157, this is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed His life for us.
Please join me now by opening your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Chapter 5. I want us to read the first 11 verses. Romans 5, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Well, let's pray again together and ask God for His blessing on His Word. Heavenly Father, thank You that there are passages like this in the Word of God that encourage us with the reminder of Your great love towards us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank You that we can sing hymns such as we've been singing to You this morning. The reminder of the depth of Your love. How can we ever plumb all of it? Father, we know that we need the ministry of Your Holy Spirit to truly understand and glory in these things. And so we ask again that You would send Your Holy Spirit to us. And may we be enabled in our souls to rejoice in these great Gospel truths. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. These past weeks, we've been rejoicing at the good news about the lifting of some of the COVID restrictions. And I certainly am happy here to be with you this morning in a larger group and look forward to an even larger group next Sunday. But we recognize it's just a start and we long for the lifting of every restriction that has been imposed. I don't think our leaders are going to win any awards for these concessions. Most people are pretty frustrated, thinking that the politicians have either done too little or too much in beginning to reopen the province. So it's good news, but it's not over the top. Some really good news on the COVID front would be if someone came up with a foolproof cure. It would mean that no one would ever get sick again with COVID. No one would die. There would be no more vulnerable populations. And there wouldn't be any discussions about whether this cure was safe or not, or whether we could trust it. But even in our advanced scientific society, with all of the progress of modern medicine, good news like that is elusive. The good news that we're considering in this brief series far surpasses even the potential 
of a foolproof COVID cure. The glorious good news that we're thinking about is a cure for sin, a far deadlier disease than COVID. This is a remedy not to keep you out of the hospital, but to keep you out of hell. This is the good news that God sent His Son to rescue condemned sinners to overcome sin in our lives and to prepare us for a blessed eternity in the presence of God. A couple of weeks ago, we focused on this truth that the Gospel, this good news, is for condemned sinners. God came up with a plan to deal with our guilt and penalty that we deserve because by nature we are rebels against God and transgressors of His law. Well, this morning we take up another aspect of this good news. We have a God who loves sinners. We have a God who loves sinners. Now often that truth is being taken for granted today and it doesn't thrill our hearts as it should. But when you consider the obstacles to God loving us, this should amaze us and make us want to sing with John Newton, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Let's begin this morning by considering the obstacles to God loving us. The obstacles to God loving us. Now many people figure today that it's no big deal for God to love us. They expect God to love us. They think that that's sort of our right from the God who has made us. They say, if God is love, then the most natural thing for God to do is to love us and to overlook our sin. But when people make claims like that, they are simply revealing that they are out of touch with reality. That they don't really know God and His character, and they don't really know man and our character. The Apostle Paul was under no such illusion. In this passage before us, in which he speaks so candidly about the love of God for sinners, he acknowledged the great difficulties that must be overcome for God to love us. Now, just consider some of the descriptions that Paul made about us in our sin. In verse 6, he describes us as people who can be called ungodly. Now that word ungodly explains our determination to refuse a relationship with God. We were created by God with the express purpose of having communion with God. That is the highest purpose that a human being can have. Often we think of, well, we were created to work and and people work. Or we were created for marriage and people get married and many things like that. But above all of those things, our highest purpose, God has made us to have a relationship with Him. And we all know about God both from the powerful testimony that He has made in this beautiful world that is all around us, as well as the knowledge of God that He has stamped upon us in our consciences. And yet before our conversion, we have refused to have a relationship with God. We refused to walk with God. We ignored Him. We wouldn't worship Him or pray to Him. Ours is a stubborn refusal to acknowledge that the One who holds our life in His hands, who gives us life and breath and so many good things, is a God we ought to pursue and desire to know. We're ungodly. We've refused that. But then in verse 8, Paul also says we're sinners. 
here's a description of our lives that identifies the things that we do. Our words, our thoughts, our actions. It reminds us that our lives before conversion are marked by a purposeful determination to live contrary to God's will. God's our maker. He has a will for us, His creatures. And yet as sinners, our determination is to live contrary to that will. His will is spelled out in places like the Ten Commandments which were not only written on tablets of stone, but also upon our hearts, so that in our consciences we know the difference between right and wrong. And every day we're faced with choices to live for God or to live for ourselves. Sin is choosing to live for ourselves, and we do that over and over and over and over again. God says... You shall have no other God before me. And we say, I'm going to worship whatever God I choose to worship. God says, don't commit adultery. And we say, I'm going to use my body for sexual pleasure any way I want to. God says, don't lie. And we say, I'm going to use my tongue to speak whatever I want to. The unconverted life is a life of thumbing your nose in the face of God. I'm my master. That's what sinners proclaim. Ungodly and sinners. Now this all has dire consequences. In verse 10, Paul reminds us that before conversion, we were enemies of God deserving His wrath. Now his language here isn't hyperbole. It's not over-the-top exaggeration. This is an accurate, realistic assessment of our relationship with God before salvation. Our sin had roused His wrath. Our rebellion trampled on His honor and authority. Our disobedience stirred His righteous anger. What we deserved was that He would come against us with all of His power and zeal, sort of like we see there in Revelation 19, and be cast into hell for an eternal punishment. And when we study the Scriptures, we understand that is not God flying off the handle, exploding in anger. That is a righteous, holy God who cannot stand by and wink at sin. Now when we understand these realities of the fact that we are ungodly, sinners, and what we deserve. When we understand these realities, you have to ask the question, how can God love sinners? These seem to be insurmountable obstacles. Our purpose today is not to answer that question specifically. We'll deal with that next time, Lord willing, when we focus on the Lord Jesus because it's His work that ultimately enables God to overcome these obstacles. Instead, this morning we're simply going to focus on this amazing truth that God does love sinners. Now may we be overwhelmed by such truth. May our hearts be warmed by this recognition. God loves me even though I don't deserve it in any way. Well, that brings us, secondly, to consider the many proofs of God's love for sinners. The many proofs of God's love for sinners. As you study through the Bible from cover to cover, and you see God revealing Himself to us so that we can know who He is and how He acts, one of the overwhelming messages we find in the Bible is this truth of God's love for unworthy sinners. 
That's why the Bible is so full of the message of mercy. God helping sinners who are helpless to save themselves. We can't do anything to get ourselves into God's favor. Nothing at all. We come with empty hands to receive salvation. That's why the Bible is a message of grace. God blessing people with salvation who don't deserve it at all. Who aren't even looking for it. Let's consider a few of these Bible proofs of God's love for sinners. There's Paul's clear statements here in Romans chapter 5. As Paul launches into this fifth chapter of his letter to the Romans, he's explaining to this church in Rome the blessings of justification. All of the things that come into our lives... Because we're now right with God through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of these blessings, Paul uh, explains here in verse 5, it's God's love being poured into our hearts through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You see, when you come to have a true understanding of how sinful you are and how ungodly you are and how much you deserve the wrath of God, it's not an easy thing to understand that God loves you. In fact, you're more readily going to look at yourself and say, how could, ever God lo- how could God ever love a wretch like me? And so, in justification, God sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts as His messenger, and part of His work is to convince us God loves you. And He does that work until we're overwhelmed with this reality that we are the object of the love of God. And then, in the following verses that we read from 6 on, Paul proceeds to explain God's love for sinners and how it can be that God loves us so much. We find him doing it here by way of comparison. He contrasts man's willingness to die for a fellow human being with God's willingness to send His Son to die in our place. Now I think that Paul was right as he gives us the descriptions here, that as human beings, no one is eager to die for anyone else. I mean, who today is just volunteering and saying, listen, I'll be willing to die for those people in the Far East. Let them come to North America. I'll go and die. You don't have a great lineup of people saying, I'll be willing to die for somebody else. Now it's true that sometimes we might say that to a family member. Sometimes a parent with a really sick child will say, you know, I wish I could take your place. But for the most part, none of us are too eager to die for anyone else. And so Paul puts it in this way in verse 7. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. When he speaks of a righteous person or a good person, these are human judgments. These aren't God's judgments. Paul has already reminded us back in chapter 3 that no one is righteous on their own. So, he wants us to imagine looking out at society, we see someone who in our opinion is a good man, a a, a law-abiding man, an upstanding citizen. And Paul says, in a pinch, in a time of crisis, we might be willing to die for such an upstanding person. But he uses the adverb here, scarcely or hardly. It could be translated with difficulty. Again, nobody's eager to die for anyone else. We certainly wouldn't do it for someone in the gutter. Someone we consider to be a low life. Someone that we despise. But maybe, just maybe... 
we might be willing to die for someone we felt to be worthy of our sacrifice. But that's not God. Because God sent Christ to die for us when we were weak, when we were helpless, when we were unable to do anything to save ourselves. He demonstrated His love for us by giving up His choicest treasure, His Son, to die in our place when we were sinners. We were in the gutters of sin and rebellion. We were thumbing our nose at God. We were trashing His name and trampling His law. And when we were at our worst, He made the ultimate sacrifice, having Jesus suffer and die in our place. That's love, dear people. That's divine love. There's nothing else in the world to compare with it. That's a love that can't be truly comprehended. That's a love that will cause us to sing for all eternity. But Romans 5 isn't the only proof in the Bible of God's great love for sinners. I want you to turn with me back to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, to the parables that Jesus gave about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Now last week when I heard Al about to preach on this, I didn't have my sermon for today already, but I knew where I was going, and I kind of thought, "Uh uh-oh, is he going to steal my thunder? And he didn't at all. Rather, he really just sort of set the table, so I don't have to repeat what he said last week, but it should be fresh on your mind. As Jesus answers the accusation of the Pharisees and religious leaders, why is Jesus, this so-called holy man, spending so much time with sinners? And so he tells these parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. Now, as we think about this first parable, of the lost sheep, and the shepherd goes searching after the lost sheep. Look at the conclusion in verses 6 and 7. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So in the human illustration, at the end of the story, the shepherd gathers all of his friends together, and there's a celebration. He's discovered his lost sheep. And then Jesus takes us up to heaven, into the throne room of God, and says, just so, there's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And then in the second parable of the lost coin, here we have this woman, she's got ten silver coins, she loses one, she sweeps, she searches the house, finally she finds the lost coin. Look at the response in verses 9 and 10. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so she is well in the human story, gathers her friends together. There's a celebration, a time of rejoicing. She's found this lost coin. And then again, Jesus takes us up to heaven. And He says there's joy before the angels of God. Now listen carefully to Jesus' words. He's not saying that the angels are rejoicing. He's saying there's joy before in the presence of the angels of God. This is not a picture of the angels rejoicing, but of joy taking place in front of them. Where are the angels standing? 
Well, they're standing around the throne of God. What is Jesus describing here? He's describing God rejoicing in the presence of the angels because one sinner has repented of his ungodly sinful ways. Brethren, these are pictures and descriptions of God that we need to let sink into our souls. Think of the times when we know great joy as human beings. Maybe it's as parents when our baby is born. And here's this baby, healthy and strong, and the joy that we know in our hearts just overflows. Or perhaps it's at a wedding. We see our child, our daughter, walking down the aisle, and again, our hearts overflow with joy. When does God have experiences like that? When do we see God, His heart overflowing with joy? Well, it's when He sees a sinner repenting. Like in that last parable of the prodigal son, the lost son. When a creature comes back to God the Father, confessing his sin, pleading his unworthiness, asking forgiveness, hoping that he can have just a lonely spot in the Father's house. That's when we see God shouting with joy. Brethren, that's the love of God for lost sinners. A final proof I want us to consider that brings this truth to our mind is the reality in the Bible of God's pleading with sinners to repent. God's pleading with sinners to repent. Now the Bible, as you know, is full of gospel invitations where we find God inviting people to come to Him for salvation. The very fact that there are such invitations is amazing. That an offended God, who is rightly angry with us because of our sins, should invite us to come to Him for a full and free forgiveness. But God doesn't simply invite. There is often what we would call an emotional element to the invitation. A plea, an impassioned call to receive and respond to the invitation. And I want us to look at one particularly poignant, moving plea. Turn back into the Old Testament to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33. Just before Daniel, Ezekiel chapter 33. We're just going to break into the middle of the chapter, verses 10 and 11. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 10 and 11. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus have you said, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Now here we find God exhorting Ezekiel the prophet about his ministry to the people of Israel who are in exile. They've been taken away into exile because of God's discipline for their sins. And even there in exile in Babylon, they have refused to repent. They've continued in their sins. And so they're recognizing they have no hope for the future. They are sinners. And so God is calling the prophet to preach to these people and urge repentance upon them. And Ezekiel is being called in his ministry 
to be like God. Now I want you to note the critical features. First of all, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now some people learning a little bit about the wrath of God and His purpose to judge sinners might imagine God delighting in casting sinners into hell. They might think of God sitting on His throne, sitting there sort of rubbing His hands as He sees sinners drop into hell and thinking, aha, finally I've gotten you and you're getting what you deserve as though there were some divine glee that God has in the punishment of wicked people. But he says very plainly, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Second truth to notice, God's pleasure is in the repentance of sinners. God would ra much rather see someone who is destined for hell recognize the error of his or her ways and turn back to God in repentance. <clears throat> it's the picture of the returning prodigal son. He's learned the hard lessons from the far country. He's discovered the emptiness of a life of sin. He's recognized that the world cannot fulfill <clears throat> the longings of his heart. And so he's turned back to his father. He wants to come back to the father. And the father is seen running to him in order to embrace him and shower him with his love. This is our God. His pleasure is seen in the repentance of sinners. It doesn't matter how great your sin is. It doesn't matter how far you've strayed from God. God is willing to receive anyone who simply will come back to Him. The third and final thing for us to recognize from God's words to Ezekiel here is that God is willing to stoop to the level of pleading with sinners. The language here is full of passion. Listen to God as He pleads with these people. Turn back. Turn back from your waywardness. There is a sense here of God pursuing people, of repeating the warnings and urging repentance, even appealing to their sense of self-preservation. Why will you die? Why would you choose hell? Why would you purposely go to a place where you're going to suffer forever? God is not content to merely sit back and watch people perish. He's not settled on His honor and taking some secret delight in the death of His enemies. God is seen pleading with His enemies to take up His offer of peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's great love for sinners. And I wonder if this is an appropriate word for anyone here this morning. Maybe God has revealed to you the depth of sin in your life. And you've been brought to see on the basis of God's Word that what you deserve is His punishment, His wrath and anger, the penalty of hell. You need to hear God pleading with you this morning through His Word. Turn back. Turn back from your sinful ways. Why would you keep going on that broad road that leads to destruction? Why would you keep giving in to sin when you can come back to Me, when you can repent of your sins and know in the Lord Jesus Christ the forgiveness of every sin that you've ever committed and experience my incredible love. If this is a word that you need to hear today, I encourage you right now where you are simply to pray to God. He can hear you in the depths of your soul and just ask Him to save you for the sake of Jesus. 
And if you're here today and you know this wonderful salvation, let me close with this exhortation. We've seen God's heart for the lost here this morning. Is this your heart for the lost? We've got people all around us who are dying and going to hell. Where's our concern? Would we run after them? Would we plead with them? Would we seek to present the Lord Jesus to them? Would we urge them to give up their waywardness and come to Christ? Do you pray for this? For opportunities to tell others the Lord, about the Lord Jesus? Do you pray for your neighbors? Do you look at the people living in the houses around you so comfortably and know that they may be comfortable now? They won't be comfortable forever. Is your burden for them? Are you praying for lost family members? Would you be willing to get down to the level of pleading with them to come to Christ? We have good news. The best news. The news that this world lives. Will we be gospel messengers proclaiming as with a trumpet that God loves sinners? Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, this is news that we don't deserve. You've taught us that. But thank You for bringing it to us. Thank You for making the Gospel so clear to us by Your Spirit's ministry through the Scriptures. Help us even today to glory in it. To be able to look at ourselves. People who used to be condemned sinners. And know that there's no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because of Your great love for us. Heavenly Father, may we revel in this and glory in it. May we rejoice in it in ways that we haven't in recent days. And Father, we pray that You would make this Gospel Word to be Your powerful Word unto salvation today to those who still don't know our Savior. And may You stir up our souls to have a concern for the lost that mirrors Your heart. O oh, Father, we know we fall so far short. Please work Your grace in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.